In this video, I have five more Premiere Pro optimization tricks that I did not share in my previous video and a all new video workflow that I've been using, which means I get render times under a minute. Really, really sick, really awesome workflow. Super stoked to share it with you and to finally expand on it. Let's jump into it. Useful tech education and gaming nostalgia that won't put you to sleep. Get subscribed and turn on notifications so you won't miss the next guide. I'm Meeples Vox here to make tech easier and more fun. Welcome back to another Premiere Pro optimization guide. I just posted one about a month or ago or so now, uh, and it did pretty well. The problem is I recorded that, I scripted that in like May-ish of 2017 and recorded it in August of 2017 and simply never got around to answering it or to editing it and releasing it rather. And part of that is because I recorded it all fancy scripted and things like that, which meant I had to go back and re-record everything that I referenced and it was a lot more work than it needed to be. So we're doing this live, which may not be a preferred format for some of you, but I just recently released a video on Twitter where I showcase all my right, render times. Do, do, do. And I had a lot of people asking how the heck I did that and what's going on here. And instead of risking someone else leaking all the information and <laughs> making their own video before mine goes up, I want to go ahead and make it, and I feel like this is a more efficient platform to do so. So I have a cool little setup here, which is what I've been using to live stream up on Twitch. I actually did my very first editing live stream on Twitch. I've done them on YouTube, but this was my first one on Twitch that I just did the day of recording this uh, that was at 1440p60, my first time streaming above 1080p60 on Twitch. It turned out really, really well. I want to do more of them, and this is the workflow I'm going to be using for it. So, of course, I have my uh, I have my primary webcam view right here, and I'm switching all of this with the Elgato Stream Deck. But then I have a production cam set up here with a GoPro knockoff, and it's not the highest quality thing in the world. It doesn't even do full 1080p60 on the HDMI out, which I've unfortunately only recently learned, but it gets the job done. And so I've got a couple different views here of my different monitors so you can see what is going on and I think it should help me explain this quite a bit. Now that all that's out of the way, we're going to cover these tips within the explanation and tour of my new workflow. So this may sound a little weird at first, but I do things in a very different way and I'm still in the process of establishing uh, all the settings like replacing my old settings for this workflow, but it winds up working out really, really nice. So this is a video I just edited and I edited it edited it that's always hard to say in the live stream up on twitch it is a review of a pair of headphones which will be going live a day or two after this video goes live this may go live over the weekend so the video will be live on monday uh, we did some really cool stuff we made a 90s commercial for the headphones and then i reviewed the headphones and when i went to render it it took less than a minute and those of you who are super in tune with how premiere works and what's going on are going to know how i did it but I can even show you it while I'm recording this, most likely without it crapping the bed. I hit export, and in theory, if the stream was accurate, my i9-7980XE is powerful enough to handle that render without totally crapping out the frame rate. And we are going to see what happens here. Go ahead and pull out to the wide view here. Of course, this is all real time. I'm talking as it's happening. It is just speeding through that really quick. And some of you are going to be like, whoa, holy crap, how are you doing that? It's really cool. And I want to give a huge shout out to the 8-Bit Duke for helping me get the final touches on this workflow. Because he saw my, I think he saw my optimization guide or at least saw some things I mentioned from it. And I was just on the tips, tips, just on the tip of getting this right. But I had a couple things set wrong. So first and foremost, you want to take a look at your sequence settings. So I'm going to hit control N. So what I normally establish, uh, let's say I go 3840, 2160, a 4K sequence 60 fps i do a lot of 4k 60 tutorials leave most things on default should be good to go the big thing that i recommended in my last video of course was to uncheck max bit, bit depth because unless you're doing 32 bit effects and footage it's a big waste of processing power and things like that especially for the final render for something you're quite literally incapable of using um but there's a lot more to this that I knew about but never remembered to set right apparently and I was embarrassed when I realized I never set all of this. So if you want a 4K 60 FPS optimized sequence, you want a couple things. You want preview file format set to GoPro Cineform 10-bit. I discussed in my previous video the optimizations you get from utilizing 
proxies or codecs of specific kinds, ProRes, DNX, HR, or Cineform. They're super, super fast to encode and decode. They're super low latency when you're editing on the timeline, and they're just incredibly useful for doing this kind of editing. They're just really great to use. Well, you can actually use this for your video previews within Premiere. What I also mentioned in the last video was use a lot, utilizing a solid state drive, be it NVMe or otherwise, for your media cache location and your scratch location, which the two of these will house your video previews and referenced files. So the combination of Cineform plus fast cache and scratch locations means that you will have incredibly fast editing on the timeline when you have previews, you know, rendered out. And if you render to Cineform, your final render will be super quick. Now, if we take a look here, one problem that I also frequently miss is I always went with lower resolution previews because I figured that made it easier, you know, and in theory going straight, just trying to, without doing any pre-rendering or anything, in theory, 1080p previews might help a little bit with performance. But if you set them to full size previews, then when you actually have previews on the timeline and use them in rendering, it speeds things up so much and you don't lose any quality. So here's what your sequence setting should look like. And then you make a sequence and then you do your editing. We're going to, actually we can make this sequence, that's fine. I'm actually gonna do a 30 FPS one since that's what all my footage is. So we're just gonna drag some clips onto here. We're not actually gonna do any editing. We're gonna throw these up here, yada yada. The only one we have to scale up is this one, which is way too small. Obviously, this is going to look like crap. This is a 640 by 480 source image. I'm going to go ahead and mute the audio out. We don't need it. And I'm also... Oh, I need to scale that one up, too. That one was 1080p and completely out of focus. That's okay. All right. So, I'm also going to apply a couple transitions. VHS there. Impact flash there. A couple transitions. And we'll apply a random effect to this one too. We'll apply the VHS filter effect to this one. I don't think that actually applied. Oh, that's a transition filter. There we go. All right. This represents a basic 40 second edit for me. Now scrubbing through the timeline, since this is all H.264, it's okay, but it's not the most responsive thing in the world because it's all H.264, which is very laggy to decode. So what you do is, is whenever you have a moment to stop editing, to take a break, to step away, to go do something else, whenever you're done editing for a session even, you go up here, you hit sequence, and render into out. And if you have a lot of stuff going on you don't want previews for, then you come over here, go to the start of what you want to render, hit I, go to the end, hit O, that sets in and out points, and then you go to sequence, render into, render into out. And you can also assign a keyboard shortcut or a macro to it and just have one big render button. Now what this is going to do, is it's going to render your previews in GoPro Cineform. So when so that when it's done, you have the entire timeline as if it was already rendered into a Cineform video, and you'll be able to scrub through the timeline super lag-free, and it'll improve rendering in just a moment once this is done. Now, a question that was asked uh, by Dimitri from Hardware Canucks, actually, in my Twitter post was like, okay, yeah, but how long does it take to render out actual video previews on your timeline? Like, are you, aren't you just getting all of that render time made up there? It has been one minute and 26 seconds for a 40 second clip. So about a minute 30. So 1.5 times real time to render the video previews is not that bad at all. It was for this Dakoni Blue review. I believe it was about eight minutes to render all of the previews for this for a five minute, 41 second video. That is essentially your render time. That is the time it takes for you to render your video. Your video is rendered. If you have no more editing to do, this video right here gets rendered. That is all it takes. And now you can see with our sequence, we have this green bar indicating we have previews to work with, and we can even go all the way up to full resolution, and we can sit here and scrub around like nobody's business. It is incredible. Playing back. It'll take a second to catch up, but then there is rarely all that many dropped frames. Like, it's still yellow. It's still dropping some just because it's trying to play back 4K video while I'm trying to record. But the actual latency, which is what matters for timeline editing, is ridiculously low, even with the super GPU-heavy effect applied. Now, if we go to Render, Control-M, now the next step is rendering to Cineform. Now, you can go to QuickTime Format and then Preset and then just GoPro Cineform YUV 10-bit. Now, you can... 
Render to quality 3, which supposedly is near lossless for a lot of formats. I use the 4, I use the default. You can, you know, 5 would be just, like, ridiculous. I use the film scan 4, just to be safe. But some people say that if you want to do a comparison, or if you do a comparison, you won't really notice a difference. That's fine. Important things here to actually make this go fast is to hit use maximum render quality. Well, that, that doesn't make it go fast. That's important for me for scaling, because um, I do a lot of scaling for my tutorials. Like, I scale in, like, 5,000 times. If you don't do a whole lot of, like, zooming in on your video, you can leave that unchecked, and it will keep things pretty fast. And then you need to check use previews. This is most important, because this uses what you already rendered. And then you tell it to export, and this is going to take literally 5 seconds to render a 40-second video. And keep in mind, it only took a minute 30 to render the previews. So we get, what, a total of, like, a little over double the length of the video to render it? Which, for me, is insane. For me, rendering my big old long tutorials, my big old long 4K60 tutorials, or my big 4K30 reviews that are 8 to 11 minutes long can take up to 2 hours, depending on the things I have going on in it, in order to render out. So, the fact that rendering the Cineform previews in the first place is quicker is huge, on top of the fact that rendering out the final final is huge. Now, another point of concern that Dimitri brought up was that in my example, that five minute review was 19 gigabytes, which he said, no, thank you. Two things here. Firstly, I believe that there is a huge workflow and mindset shift you can take as a result, which makes this a lot better because yeah, sure. That's a huge ass file. If you have really, really bad upload speeds or inconsistent, or like if it drops out, you can't, your uploads interrupted and you got to start over understandable. But for me, this means that instead of spending two hours or more, or like in the case of my OBS versus Slobs video where I kept throwing an error over and over, and it'd take up to an hour to get to that point, and then throw a new error, and so it wound up taking four hours to render that one video, instead of all that time being spent, that time I spent uploading, which means I still get to use my computer. Here's the issue. Even on my 36-thread 7980XE with a GTX 1080, Rendering a video still goes full tilt on my computer unless I make it not, which means that trying to do other things is slow and not a good idea. So not having to spend two hours being unable to use my computer and instead just waiting for it to upload a little bit longer, that is a huge trade-off I am more than willing to take. I am excited to make that trade-off. This has been the best trade-off in the world. And for those of you asking, yes, YouTube does now support Cineform uploads. You can upload straight Cineform files and it will process them, and then you have no compression, so it has the highest possible quality file for it to work with to do compression, which winds up looking pretty good. Secondly, though, is you can still compress it to H.264 or X2, H.265 or even X.264 now, since you have this master file that is basically lossless. You can then just run it through Adobe Media Encoder, Handbrake, Avisynth to Avisynth or whatever to go to X.264. You can run it through any compression. Just raw compressing the file should only take maybe real time, depending on your specs. Like, it doesn't take anywhere near as long as compressing as you're rendering. And so, your speeds are way better. Way better. Now, this does not fix the minus 165905 whatever Lumetri error that so many of us keep randomly running into in Premiere Pro ever since the CC 2017 update, which... Doesn't always relate to Lemetri, since Lemetri isn't always running on the clips that it crashes on, but it's been a huge bane of my existence. Terran seems to be experiencing it. It seems to be pretty common, and Adobe has no overall answer as to why it's happening. This doesn't fix this. If you run into that error, it's basically going to stop on that frame every time when you're rendering the timeline. Rendering the timeline does prevent that error from happening during encoding. And the cool thing about rendering timeline previews here, if I switch back here, is if it cancels like... At this point in the video, if it's like if it runs into a hang and only renders previews up to here, then if I close it and reload it and start rendering previews again, all of those previews are already rendered. I don't lose any rendering progress. Whereas if you're doing an H.264 render and it crashes mid-render like my OBS versus Streamlabs OBS video did, you lose all of that progress. So that's really cool. There is one last tip involving all of this in order to speed up renders or to generally improve stability and performance. And that is when you have big After Effects graphics like my lower thirds, my intro, my end cards, things like that. Instead of just using 
the, if I drag in here, instead of just using the dynamically linked file here, right click and go to render and replace. And then you can choose format QuickTime and then choose preset GoPro Cineform 10 bit. Now, if you have something like a lower third, which needs the alpha channel as an overlay, you'll want to choose GoPro 12 bit with alpha. But for normal clips, GoPro Cineform 10 bit, I put it in my scratch folder. So it's in the faster location to be referenced when rendering. And then I can easily delete it when the project's done and you tell it to go. It'll analyze the project and render that file as a Cineform file, just like everything else. Unfortunately, this does not work with uh, specific effects. Like if the, a third party effect is applied on a clip and you render and replace, the effect is still applied to the clip. It doesn't render the effect in the clip and you cannot do this with an actual nested sequence, which is really obnoxious. That'd be a huge lifesaver. So just to recap here, this went on a little bit longer than I expected. Uh, set up your sequence settings to utilize GoPro Cineform 10-bit previews. Make sure your preview resolution matches your actual sequence resolution. Save your presets for that and everything. Disable maximum bit depth. If you don't do a whole lot of crazy scaling, disable max render quality. Make that your preset sequence format. Render and replace dynamically linked graphics or otherwise complex, you know, self-created scenes. And if you can't render and replace like the sequence, if this was giving me trouble, then I can just double click the nested sequence, hit control M and render this out as Cineform myself and then replace the, se the nested sequence with the file if I needed to. So you can always do that manually. And then remember to timeline render by hitting render into out. This is what Final Cut Pro does in the background that all the Mac users brag about, about how, uh, about how great performing it is and things like that is it is taking your timeline whenever you're idle and rendering it in a fancy file format like Cineform and rendering that out so that when you edit again, it's faster. And when you go to render, it is faster. So that is what they have going on. And you can do the same thing in Premiere. You just have to do it manually, which is what I discussed in my last video. You have most of the same optimizations. You just have to manually do them yourself because it's not really much of an automatic software. And then lastly, of course, is your render settings. You want to be rendering to a Cineform preset. Start with the GoPro Cineform 10 bit and then adjust settings such as enabling max render quality if you need it and make sure use previews is checked. And then once you have things how you like it, hit save preset, give it a name and always render to that preset. And then you can compress later if you need to. So this was a fairly lengthy video for just five more Premiere optimization tips. But honestly, this new workflow has changed my life for editing. I still have a huge, I, I just, this has blown my mind. The fact that I was right there and I kept missing like the sequence codec or the sequence preview resolution, little things that would have gotten me to this point kind of makes me mad, but I am super stoked to finally be at this point. And that means that my editing live streams don't drop frames quite as much because all of this is super like fancy and lightweight. So I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it helpful. Be sure to watch it a couple times through if you need to, to get your workflow set up. Cause I know I threw a lot at you, but I wanted to make sure I get this information out there and available to you guys. If you liked it, hit the like button, get subscribed for more awesome tech content. And I'll, I'll see you in the next, I'll see you in the next one. This video is sponsored by viewers like you. Our videos would not be possible without the generosity of those of you who contribute to one of our fan funding options via donor box, Twitch subscriptions, direct contributions via PayPal or Patreon. To join our inner circle and get behind the scenes looks at videos, go to eposvox.com support to learn more and join us on discord at eposvox.com discord. Thanks.